Okay. So welcome if you are tuning in uh, after the fact. We are just setting up for our, um, our noon presentation for Boston by Map. Um, if you are watching live, hello. We are going to start in just a second, um, but we're going to wait for some people to show up. Um, we are very happy to be here. We've been doing this um, monthly. We did a December one and a January one, and then this is February, halfway through. Um, and then hopefully we'll keep doing this every month. Um, if you want to see the... Oh, actually, so because these are very similar, we're going to only have one up at a time on YouTube and Facebook. But if you ever want to see a past one, just let us know and we can, um, we can hook you up. So we are going to kind of start with a, a presentation from Dennis. Um, but just so everybody knows, this is a, like a very specific part of history that we're talking about. We're not really covering um, a, a very large swath of history that happened before colonization. So it's important to recognize that these places were hab inhabited for a very long time before the period that we're talking about and the land was um, was managed and the land was uh, used in a variety of ways um, besides the ways that we're going to talk about. Um, if you ever wanna check out, I'm gonna put this in the comments, um, nativeland.ca, oh, sorry, native-land.ca. Um, I fixed it. <laughs> um, I definitely recommend um, checking that out. It'll show you what kinds of um, what kinds of treaties have been signed for the land that you're on, and uh, who used to live there, who still lives there, who has claim to the land. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and yeah, so that's that's kind of our mini land acknowledgement for the day. Um, so my name is Rachel Mead. I'm the Public Engagement and Interpretation Coordinator at the MAP Center. And this is Dennis McCarthy, who is a longtime volunteer at the MAP Center, uh, longer than I've been at the MAP Center. And um, he knows a lot about Boston in general. Um, he does Boston by foot tours and um, Art and architecture tours of the library when when that exists and um we were just chatting about how the library is very sad and abandoned right now but hopefully someday there will be art and architecture tours once again so dennis would you like to uh take it away okay how me just uh can you bring up the oh i can we get back to the beginning if you want to bring up the share are we in the right place yes excellent thank you thank you rachel um so this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to sort of introduce this idea of history through maps and go through one example for about 10 minutes worth of detail. Uh, and then I'm, we're going to pop back out and talk about, um, you know, what maps of Boston you might want to start with, with your project or what story you might want to tell. And then be, after that, we'll talk about where you can find these maps online. And Rachel will give us a demo of a couple great uh, key, um resources at the Leventhal. And then finally, we'll go from presentation mode to more discussion mode where you can ask questions and tell us what your project is and what you might uh, find helpful. So history through maps is just using historic maps of, in this case, Boston, to answer questions like, what used to be here, or where I'm standing now, or where is that feature you're talking about on, a, uh, on today's map? Or how does a, this part of Boston develop over time? For instance, how did the how did Copley Square in the Back Bay, where the BPL is, develop over time? And the example we're going to use to motivate this today is cutting down the hills to fill the cove. So back in the late 50s, a man named Walter Muir Whitehill published a book called Boston, a Topographical History. And he coined that phrase uh, in that book. I'm going to click over and take a quick peek at a... Uh, um, a reconstructed map of Boston. This is a modern map showing what Boston looked like in 1630. Boston was just the Shawmut Peninsula here back then. Um, and 
if it, the uh, dark green is the original land and this lighter green is made land. Most of that, uh, the original Shaman Peninsula is 487 acres estimated. Uh, and the uh, it's a, that's now surrounded by 500 acres of made land. Most of that land was made in the 1800s. And a lot of it was made by cutting down the hills to fill the coves. So uh, let's talk about where were those hills, first of all. Here's a 1775 map of Boston at the time of the American Revolution. And there are hills, uh, whoops, a little bit too much there. There are hills, there's a hill up here in the north end. This is called Copse Hill. You may know it from as a Copse Hill burying ground. There was another hill on the south, in the south end over here called Fort Hill because of the fort that was on top of it. And then to the west, there was a, a ridge of three peaks that called the Tri Mountain. In the center was Beacon Hill that everybody's heard of. Uh, to the east of that was a hill that was called Cotton Hill at this time, later Pemberton Hill. And to the west, there was another hill, uh, which was called West Hill and Polite Company. The author of this map was a British officer, so he used a more military term, you know, how it was known to the soldiers because of the red light district that was there. Now, I'm going to switch over from here to another, the next map in this reconstruction series whoop, uh, to show what Boston looked, what the shoreline looked like here in uh, the end of the 1700s. Here's the Shawmut Peninsula. That There's a cove on the east, the town cove, as it was called, labeled here. There's a cove up here on the north that uh, shows a mill dam running, uh, separating the cove into the inner area called the mill pond uh, and the other area next to the Charles. The mill, that mill dam was actually created in the 1640s so that uh, they built water powered or tide powered mills at the entrances to God, grind grain. And then there's this West Cove uh, that's west of Beacon Hill today. There's also a South Cove. We're not going to talk about that, though, because there were no hills chopped down to uh, fill that. So let's take a look at now this. Uh, Rachel will provide everyone with a handout, a PDF file, in which you can follow all these links and see everything I'm showing you so you don't have to uh, try and hurriedly write down notes. So first, we're going to talk about how that North Cove got filled. Um, in eight, in uh, 1800, uh, new ownership took over the mill pond and the mills uh, next to it. And they promptly announced that they were going to fill the pond and sell the land. Uh, a, a lengthy political and legal conflict ensued between the town and the proprietors. But in 1807, that was resolved. And um, Charles Bullfinch was asked to write, uh, to come up with a street plan for the new made land. And this is what he came up with, this triangular shape. Uh, and if we, we can now, let me just sneak over to look, overlay this on a map so you can see where this is in Boston today. This area is called the Bullfinch Triangle. It's bounded by Causeway Street, Merrimack Street, and North Washington Street. And you can see that as we sort of fade this map out. And this corner, here is uh, <clears throat> Haymarket Square. Now, uh, this was filled uh, by, cutting, by cutting down partially two of the hills that we looked at before. Uh, <clears throat> part of Copps Hill over here, and then part of the Beacon Hill in the Tri Mountain. Here, as you can see how big Copps Hill was originally, this is Snow Hill Street, as it's known today, that goes over, that went over the hill in colonial times. Everything west of Copps Hill got cut down and carried into the pond to fill it. And you can see that if you go to Snow Hill Street today, where Hudson Street comes in, on the left here, you can see this big retaining wall. That's the original hill. And this is where the other part of Copps Hill used to be, uh, as you head towards uh, Bullfinch Triangle. Now, the um, other hill that was partially cut down was Beacon Hill. This is an illustration showing Beacon Hill in the process of being cut down. Beacon Hill was behind the State House before the State House grew that big addition that heads north out of it. Uh, there was a, originally there was a beacon on top of Beacon Hill. Uh, it was a pole with a bucket of flammable 
uh, stuff inside that they could light to uh, as a, a warning to the town that something's going on. They never actually used it, and it was uh, removed when the hill was removed, or actually it was replaced in the 1790s by this monument, also designed by Bullfinch. That was removed when the hill was torn down, and uh, it was only re uh, put up again in the 1890s in its current location. Now, uh, it took about 20 years to fill the Bullfinch Triangle. Uh, this map from 1826 shows the area still labeled the Mill Pond, but it shows all the streets in there. In fact, the land had been made by that time, but nothing was on it. This is a sketch looking, actually, if we go back, this is Traverse Street here. And the sketch I'm going to show you is uh, looking down Traverse Street from the east here. And what you can see is the land has been made, but there's nothing yet on it. That's the dome of the state house. This is a drawbridge opening to let a ship pass. Uh, Bullfinch's plan had a canal running through it next to what's now still called Canal Street. Now that filled out the um, mill pond behind the, behind the dam here, but beyond the dam that was filled out starting in the 1830s. So uh, what happened was that, I'll look at this 1838 map. Here you can see land is being made and it was made mostly by railroads for depots. Rail, uh, the first railroad coming into Boston from the north was the Boston and Lowell here. It crossed the river on a trestle bridge to went to its railroad station right here. If you were standing down at the end of what was in Lowell Street, at where my cursor is, and looking up past towards that little L shape at the end, this is what you would have seen. That's the original Boston and Lowell Depot. Uh, where did this land come from? Well, it actually came from cutting down Pemberton Hill. That was the, this hill, the easternmost of the Tri Mountain. Uh, Pemberton Hill uh, um, was purchased, or the area here was purchased by Patrick Tracy Jackson in the 1830s, and he wanted to level it to uh, create an, a residential neighborhood there. And he arranged for that earth to be removed and transported to the river or was dumped along the shoreline to make land for that railroad station. Here's a picture of Pemberton Square. Uh, after it had built up, it was quite an elegant neighborhood. You can actually see it uh, labeled here. We don't have a hill anymore. We have over here Pemberton Square. So that's uh, the um, mill pond. Now let's quickly take a peek uh, over at the westernmost of the Tri Mountain. Um, that was uh, in uh, the, if we look at the hill here, we're going to be looking at now this hill on the west. I'm gonna jump ahead to an 1803 map to show you what it looked like at the beginning of the 1800s. Um, so here is a common. There was a, uh, some land had been made here and the beginning of the, what's now Charles Street had been created. But once you got beyond Beacon Street, the streets on Beacon Hill went down to the, new, the shoreline here. The hill was right here. It was quite steep going down to Beacon Street into the west. And here you can see this, the line of the proposed street of extending Charles Street up to the West Boston Bridge. By 1805, it's mapped by the same uh, surveyor, shows all these streets now ending in a new Charles Street and a thin strip of land here. And by 1814, there's actually um, more land has been made outside of Charles Street and some buildings are starting to go up. This is the third Baptist church. Uh, the Baptists liked this location because they could do the baptisms right here in the river next to it at high tide. Uh, that's no longer the third Baptist church, but that building, building still exists at the corner of Mount Vernon and uh, Charles Street in Beacon Hill neighborhood. By the way, when they were making the land, what they did was uh, they had tracks running down the hill. Um, and there were two sets of cars and two sets of tracks. And they were cars were tied together by a long rope that went through a pulley at the top of the hill. And so uh, they would load the cart, the, the carts at the top of the hill and unload the carts at the bottom of the hill at the same time. And then they'd use gravity. The heavier carts would go downhill and pull up the empty carts 
and reverse the process and just go back and forth and back and forth. Uh, Dennis, can we yes. um, can we address some some questions and Absolutely. comments? Absolutely. Let me. Yeah. What do we got? So we have one um, from on the 1775 map. It says it says Corpse Hill and not Cops Hill, which it does. But it was called. But it's Cops Hill. I, I guess yeah. that's a typo. Um, uh, the good catch, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. This person is um, very very astute. Also mentioned that uh, the canal. Uh, ran all the way to Lowell. Yeah, actually, um, just to be perfectly clear, let me go back and pop up, up a map. Uh, let's try that 1826 map of Boston. Uh, here we go. I'll get it yet. <laughs> uh, this one have Boston in the vicinity. So the uh, the canal, the Middlesex Canal, actually ended up here. Uh, and bo canal boats could continue down this Prison Point Bay, across the river, and enter the canal shown on the Bullfinch map, and take it through the Bullfinch Triangle, where it connected up with the old mill pond that allowed water to go into here. So, they, so the canal boats could take a shortcut from the Middlesex Canal across the peninsula, instead of having to go all the way around. Mm. And then else? they unloaded at Haymarket? Uh, some of them would, would go through and stop at Haymarket and unload there because that was the gas station for Boston. The hay coming down from Chelmsford was sold there, and that was what you powered your vehicles with, keeping hay to the horses. <laughs> and then um, some questions about the the hills, mm -hmm. the the Tri-Montane. That, um, is that where the yeah. name Tremont comes from? And, and it is, yeah. It, yes. So very, very accurate. And then one person was uh, aghast at the the officer's uh, naming of Mount Hordom. He didn't make that up. That's what the soldiers all called it. Yep. And the sailors too. Yep. Now, uh, I forgot to mention though that when the uh, when that was when that when the uh, that hill was cut down, uh, that project was started in the 1790s by a group of real estate developers. And they didn't want to call their new neighborhood Mount Hordon for obvious reasons, so they renamed it Mount Vernon. Sounds much classier associated with Washington. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, probably a good PR move. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have one more to do um, uh, uh, in our little hill, Coves to Hill story. And that's uh, two separate projects, uh, um, Fort Hill and the Town Cove. So uh, going back to our old map, on the east side, you have the town cove here. And here's Fort Hill down here. Uh, the, the fort was removed after the American Revolution. And um, the, uh, it became Washington Square. So it's Washington Place here, later Washington Square. Uh, and it was initially uh, a, re you know, a high end, a, you know, fashionable residential district. This is a image of what it, you know, this is the view from the top of, of Fort Hill, Washington Square. As you can see, we have open space, even cattle grazing, large, widely spaced homes, lots of open space there. Uh, over the, uh, the half century leading up to the 1840s, though, uh, the two things happened. The uh, one was that the central business districts is over here sort of grew with the city and began moving towards this residential district. So people started moving out. Uh, absentee landlords bought up the, the homes, subdivided them into rooming houses. Uh, and then at the other thing that happened in the 1840s was of course, tens of thousands of Irish immigrants arrived in Boston. And many of them would uh, look for homes right near the waterfront near the docks where they worked. And so a lot of this area started to become built up. So if we look at, uh, here's an atlas from 1874. The red, here's, uh, here's Washington Square. Uh, this is the one of those insurance atlases, it's color coded. So the red buildings are brick buildings. The yellow buildings are wooden buildings. They be, the absentee landlords began building basically wooden shacks to fill in all these spaces and renting them out to Irish immigrants at very low prices. Uh, it made for a squalor. And in actually in 1849, 
Uh, this area was the center of a cholera epidemic, particularly right here was what was called Half Moon Square. This is an illustration from the 1849 report on the cholera epidemic. It was considered the most crowded space with all these shacks and even people living in basements with no windows here. Uh, so the uh, uh, what the powers that be decided that it would be best to, they could, they could solve two problems by taking down the hill. One was to um, remove the, the uh, the squalid neighborhood and the and, and incidentally the Irish who lived there, and the other was to uh, create more flat space where the central businesses business could expand. So in 1865, the Fort Hill project started. The first thing they did was cut a swath through the hill. So if we look at the map here, they basically are going to extend Oliver Street down the Purchase Street by cutting through the hill. This is uh, the the path they cut, this pedestrian bridge allowed children who lived on one side to go to the school on the other side of the cut. But they, uh, they, but they sort of ran out of places to put the land and the project came stalled by 1868. So before they could take down the whole hill. Now enter a completely separate movement. Uh, Boston businessmen had decided at this time that the city was losing business because there wasn't a good rail connection between the uh, railroad depots up by North Station and the, and the other railroad depots down by what's now South Station. So they proposed uh, building, uh, writing a railroad around the peninsula to the new, um, to uh, move trains back and forth. If you heard of the, you may have heard of the North-South Rail Link proposal. That's sort of a, an early version of that. So what they're going to do is they're going to basically straighten out the shoreline by putting a new uh, road, Atlantic Avenue across here, and then filling all of the land behind it. So here's the proposed road, and then I would have to fill in all these that are labeled docks, open water. That got started in 1868. Uh, they obviously needed uh, fill for Atlantic Avenue and the docks behind. Uh, the Fort Hill was project needed, had a hill they were looking to get rid of. Atlantic Avenue project had a hole in the ground they wanted to fill, so the two projects became linked by, as another example of cutting down the hills to fill the coves. So and basically they're gonna move Fort Hill into the town cove there. Um, this is a, so full scale demolition got underway. This is a photo of it from 1871. Uh, what you don't see in this photo, but in other, in other photos I wasn't able to locate on the internet, there's a, one of a steam excavator loading carts that go along a movable railroad. And so here's a bird's eye view of Boston from 1870. You can see the work in progress here. Uh, up up, this is Long Wharf, Central Wharf here. Up above, between Long Wharf and Commercial Wharf, they've actually made Atlantic Avenue and filled behind. Uh, they haven't got down here to India Wharf yet. This, by the way, is uh, what India Wharf looked like when they had built Atlantic Avenue, but not filled the dock behind it. They, had, they haven't cut through uh, India Wharf yet. What happened was this new road, Atlanta, uh, Atlantic Avenue, I'm gonna now switch over to an 1867 F, uh, or 1874 view. It cut through the existing war. So here's India Wharf. You can see that's the after, this is the before. Here's India Wharf. Now it's got a big hole in it for Atlantic Avenue. As you go north, more of the same. There's Central Wharf with a big hole in it for Atlantic Avenue. You can also see on this map the Union Freight Railway is running here. Uh, uh, it, it actually continued to operate till 1970. And up here you can see the same thing happened to Commercial Wharf. It used to be one long wharf and it got cut in half, cut in two pieces here by the street. This is where Columbus park is today. Uh, and so if you go to Columbus Park and uh, the north side of it, you'll, you can and walk along Atlanta, the old Atlantic Avenue here, you can look to your right and see one part and look to your left and see the other part. Was so the that, um, was the railway running just down the middle of the street? Right down the middle of the street. I There are old photographs available online. Let me see if I can get one up quickly for you. I might have a picture in my notes. Oh. 
Uh, no, I don't have one here, unfortunately. But yeah, it ran down the middle of the street. Uh, um, and uh, not only that, but in 1901, when the Boston, when Boston's, Boston's elevated uh, mass transit opened, there mm -hmm. was actually actually built an elevated train, like in Chicago, that went right down Atlantic Avenue and Commercial Street. So you had freight train at ground level, mass transit train running directly above it. So that's the, uh, let me advance to our oh, other slides, because that's, that's basically what I wanted to show you as an example. So where do you go? So the next step is to talk about where do you go to get maps? Uh, and what maps do you get? Because if you go to the Leventhal site, there's in search for maps of Boston, you're going to get thousands of hits. Mm -hmm. So I put together this sort of top 10 list of, you know, best of just as a, these are great, good places to start. Uh, the list was, uh, comes from two sources, Nancy Seashole's book called Gaining Ground, which is sort of the definitive uh, book on history of Boston land making. Uh, and so she, her, her book is uh, organized by neighborhood, but there's some maps that get used in multiple neighborhoods. They're just good quality and they show important points in time. And then uh, that list was supplemented by suggestions from Peter Grimm, the previous uh, curator at the Leventhal Map and Education Center. So these are you know links you can follow uh, when you're uh, looking at the handout. Now, where do you find these maps uh, online today? Which is, this is really a great thing because 20 years ago when I got started in this, there was very little in the way of good maps online. Um, and today, you know, you, you used to have to go to the library or the Athenaeum or other places to find the, to get a look at these maps. Now you can just go online to the Leventhal Map Center. So at this point, Rachel is going to take over and show us a couple of these great resources there. Sure. So um, I want to start with Atlas Scope. Um, I I do want to say like thank you, Dennis, for for loving our maps and our resources so much. I did just um, write an article. Uh, well, more of a more of an interview. I didn't do much of the work um, where I interviewed Joe Bagley, the city archaeologist of Boston, about how he uses Atlas Scope for his um, historical research. Um, before he starts a dig and while he's working on on uh, researching a dig. So it's really useful to a variety of people, professionals and uh, amateurs alike. Um, and Atlas Scope is, here, where am I? Here's Atlas Scope. So um, basically what we've done is we've geotransformed um, these amazing atlases of Boston, which we call urban atlases as kind of a, a larger term, but they include fire insurance atlases and real estate atlases of Boston. Um, they have uh, an immense level of detail, most of them. You saw um, in 1867 and in 1874 a map that Dennis showed before of downtown Boston, but we have coverage of, of all of Boston and a bunch of the inner suburbs and other cities around Boston. Um, currently serving 101 atlases. Um, so there are a lot of layers to look at. You have a bunch of options here. You can uh, click Find Me, which is really fun um, if you're walking around and using this on your cell phone. Um, it can uh, kind of track you and you can look at the, the history as you walk by it. We can also search places or we can start downtown at, at Copley at BPL. So I'm going to click search places and um, somebody who I'm not sure is here, but somebody filled out the survey for, for what they wanted to hear us talk about today and was interested in Fan Peer. So I'm going to just go to Fan Peer just for some fun to check it out to show you how this works. Um, so you can only search addresses that, that still exist, which is definitely um, a little bit annoying sometimes because the address changed over the years. So it's possible that the address that you're looking for now has a very different name or a different street number than the address um, that, that it had back then. Um, so sometimes you have to pan around and see if the especially street number has changed. Um, Alice Scope will automatically take you to the oldest layer. 
usually. So um, this is the oldest full layer that it has. Everything else is on the edge. So 1882 Hopkins. Let's see what happens if we... So these older ones um, are showing areas that are, that are outside of the scope of this little bubble. Um, Vampir is kind of a hard one. A lot of these maps are on the edge. Let me see. So they're, they show um, downtown Boston, but they um, don't show the kind of seaport area. Um, so this is a hard one to research, I would say. So for, for whoever, I think Mark, whoever is doing this research, um, I'm not sure Aliscope is the tool for you, to be honest. Um, but there are definitely, oh, here we go. There are definitely good maps of it. So this 1885 one is an especially detailed map, um, which I really love. Um, one of the things that, that Joe Bagley pointed out is like how good the, um, when it loads, <laughs> how good the, the like typography is on here. I mean, it's handwritten mostly and, and how, how clear it is and at what high resolution we have scanned it. So you can see both of these piers, you can see all this information, like there's a conveyor running above roof of, of the warehouse. You can see that there's an office and that it has um, six extinguishers and 8,300 feet of hose, which is very important if you're uh, insuring an area for um, fire insurance. There's a proposed pier number three here and a proposed pier number four, or a filled pier number four that hasn't been built. So the process of being built. Something that Dennis alluded to earlier that I think is a, a good little factoid is that docks back then um, were the, the water between the piers. So like the, the town dock downtown is an area of water kind of in the middle of what is now dock square, but not the, um, not the land around it. So today when we say dock, we usually mean a pier, but for them it was the water. But yeah, oops. So um, very highly detailed. Here's the grain elevator and all of this information about the grain elevator, um, which we're all tilting our heads to see, but <laughs> really great, great um, detail. Uh, this is a really beautiful map, a particularly beautiful map. I'm glad I found this one. Um, so that's Atlas Scope and we can come back to it a little bit in a second. But something else that I wanted to talk about is just our collections website. Um, so collections.leventhalmap.org. Um, and there are a bunch of ways that you can kind of peruse our collections. Uh, like Jenna said, you can just search Boston here, but you're gonna come up with an overwhelming number of maps. Oops. Um, you're gonna come up with an overwhelming number of maps and it's probably gonna hurt your brain. Um, so there are a couple of different ways that you can you can go about this. Um, you can also click on our exhibitions, which shows you um, an online version of all of our exhibitions, including our current one, Bending Lines, which I highly recommend. You can actually geo-reference maps. So the same way that, that these are kind of, to excuse the term, mapped onto uh, <laughs> current modern maps of Boston, um, you can actually put in control points and help us enhance our digital collections. We have a lot of educational materials as well um, that you can use and that you can also create. We have a great tool called Map Sets um, that you can use if you're an educator. And then we have some collections of distinction. So if you are looking for something specific, we have um, a really great collection of American Revolutionary War era maps, um, some of which Dennis used in, in the presentation. Um, of course, a large collection of Boston and New England maps, maritime charts and atlases, which are always really fun to look at and are often very beautiful, and then urban maps, um, which include all of these atlas scope um, collections. Um, you can, so I'm gonna, for the sake of argument, gonna just type in Boston. Um, and then you'll see that it comes up with 
I'm going to guess thousands of results. Yeah, so 7,851 results. But you can uh, filter your search. So I recommend doing that. Um, some of the filters, like not everything is tagged entirely appropriately. So you'll see that like here it says Boston, there are only a thousand things that are actually tagged Boston. And I would guess that there are probably more than that of Boston. Um, the, you can go by topic. A really helpful filter is by year. So I really love to do that. Um, this is interesting. You can choose maps that are from the future. Um, <laughs> I want to look at that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to think about that for later. Um, the creator is a really useful um, kind of thing to look at, especially if you are looking for, you know, government created maps or urban atlases, if you're looking for like specific publishers. Um, and then you can look through a specific collection or look at maps that are or aren't geo-referenced. Um, when Dennis was showing the picture of the, or the map of the um, Bullfinch Triangle, that one was geo-referenced and um, put over a, a modern map of Boston. So you can see like this one is as well. You can look at just the map and then you can also look at the map overlay, which will automatically automatically do like kind of what what we've done in atlas scope and um put the map over like a modern uh map of boston area so this is a very a very fun way of looking at um looking at maps and for the ones that are not geo-referenced you can actually do it yourself so if you're interested in doing that you can definitely try it out or contact us if you want guidance um, but I think this is a really fun activity. If you are if you are bored or if you are interested in maps or you want to learn how it works, um, I find it a very comforting thing to do. <laughs> um, so yeah, these are these are our collections. Um, this is Atlas Scope. If anybody has questions about how Atlas Scope works or if you want to explore a specific um, neighborhood or address in Atlas Scope, please uh, let us know in the comments. Dennis, you're getting a lot of uh, love in the comments, just so you know. You're a Thank font you. of knowledge. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So you want to send that back to me and I'll yeah. just finish. Uh, so um, if you don't, if by any chance you're looking for something uh, local that you don't find at the 11th Hall, there's a couple other. Uh, resources linked here. The Massachusetts Real Estate Digitization Project has digitized all sorts of atlases, uh, state atlases, county atlases, and individual towns. So if you lived in, you know, Cohasset and wanted to see an atlas, an historic atlas of your town, you just click on the link and it would take you to, an, in this case, a 1903 atlas. Uh, also, uh, there's a thing called the Boston Atlas at the Boston Planning and Development Agency website. Uh, they have, a, there's a big overlap in content uh, between this and the uh, Leventhal, but they do have some, some things Leventhal don't. And they have a, a user interface that's similar to Atlas Scope, but different. But so anyway, there's, they, if you don't find it at the Leventhal, you've got a couple other places you can go. And then while, um, Rachel was talking, I, I snuck out and got a picture <laughs> of, I thought I got a picture of, uh, so I seem to have lost my picture that I had of the, uh, here we go, this was the thing I wanted. Oh, I know where it is. It's in my slide deck, sorry. It's <laughs> right one up. I put it here. This is uh, the Union Freight Railroad. This oh, is, wow. This is Commercial Street. This is Lewis Wharf. It's still there today in the North End. This giant building here is says Quincy Market Cold Storage. That, uh, that's now the parking lot on Sergeant's Wharf. It was torn down in the 60s to make way for redevelopment that the BRA never got around to doing. Okay, so last thing is uh, now we switch mode and uh, 
you know, would love to hear what you're doing, what you want to know about. And I'm going to refer you here to the, the research page on the Leventhal map site that tells you what kinds of things the map center can do for you and uh, how to get in touch with them. Yeah, so we would love to help you out with your research project, whether we have the maps for it or not, um, whether it's you creating your own map or you using maps that already exist. Um, we have people that can help you with either one of those things. Um, we have uh, geospatial information services. So our, um, our GIS uh, librarian actually has open office hours every Friday for um, addressing any and all of your geospatial uh, research concerns um, or, or joys, as the case may be. And um, our reference librarian is like literally the, the most knowledgeable person in the world about our collections and she can uh, answer any questions that you have about that. So um, if you don't even know uh, what it is you need help with, we still wanna help you. Um, so make an appointment um, to, to talk to us um, on this page and um, or you can always just email any of us as well. I will drop my email in the uh, chat. Oops, that's a comma, not a period. Okay, um, so so definitely let me know if you need help with anything or if you just wanna chat more about Atlascope or about um, maps of Boston, or if you wanna get in touch with Dennis um, and learn more from, from this font of information. Um, today's video will be, someone has asked, today's video will be on uh, YouTube and Facebook um, for the foreseeable future, probably for the next month. Um, and we are always happy to, to send it to you again uh, after that. So um, it'll be, I think, in the same place that it is now. Um, although I'm not always clear on how Facebook and YouTube change their links after something has been has gone live so um if anybody has any research questions right now if anybody just wants to look up their address on atlascope i'm happy to do that as well um or if you want to just type in what's your you know what brought you here what you're doing that we'd be fascinated to learn what you're trying to do with yeah me. let us know um drop it in the chat um, in the meantime, I just love this map so much. I'm glad that, glad that I looked it up. What does this say? Yeah, this is, uh, <clears throat> at present used mostly for cotton. <laughs> They're just so beautiful. Um, so I, I definitely recommend checking them out. Um, if you if you haven't had time to do that so far, take a break during your day. Um, just go to, here I'll drop it, atlascope.leventhalmap.org. Um, and we would definitely love to, to show you around. So, if nobody has questions, which is okay, um, I can, what should I do? I would love to just keep looking at this map. <laughs> oh, there's a seawall here. That's interesting. Yeah, that's uh, the, we, sh we should bring up an older map that shows the lobster claw. Let me let me see if I can find one <laughs> while you're on because uh, that this is a four point channel. This land along it was made as like a strip. And if uh, mm. let me switch over and to my other browser, and I think the all probably has. Oh, one one more resource that that I think Dennis used in this that is very. Uh, applicable to all of this um, research is digitalcommonwealth.org. Um, so it's a um, 
a site that kind of compiles all of the historical collections from across the state, um, including our collections at the MAP Center and BPL's collections in general. Um, so if you wanted to search like Van Pier uh, in here, then um, one of the one of the most useful things to me that I find is the uh, photography uh, exhibits. So here are some really beautiful pictures of of Van Pier. <laughs> Something that always happens is you get no matter what you search, you're always going to get um, the Liberator uh, somehow, which is great that there's such a good collection of the Liberator, but it's I always think that's funny. So what year is this? This photo is from 1926 from the Leslie Jones collection. So if we go to 1919, this is what it's, this is roughly what it's looking at. Um, which is including the the sugar refining company, I guess, is, is a lot of those buildings that, that you're looking at there. And uh, NECO, the New England Confectionery Company. And if you uh, walk down to that neighborhood, those a couple of those buildings are still there. And on one, there's brick warehouse buildings. And on one of them, you can see the faint, faded image of the NECO logo yeah this this kind of um curvy building is still there um i wrote i wrote an article that's on our website about candy tours um a candy tour of boston that came out around halloween if you guys want to check that out there's a lot of candy history confectionery history in boston and in cambridge especially um, the neck that led to the north end. I think she's talking. Someone has asked about. Yeah, let me uh, pop back over to that um, 1775 map. So I there's uh, the neck is usually used to describe this little this little strip of land that connected the Shawmut Peninsula to the uh, mainland. But as you can see, there's also a narrow section sort of here between the North End and the rest of the Shaman Peninsula. And if that's what you're talking about, uh, today, let's let's actually look at, let's see if this is overlaid or not. Let's see if we can find an overlay map. Yeah, there's an overlay map, excellent. So if we zoom in like Rachel was doing earlier and look at where that map, where this area here is, this narrow area, that's part of the North End. That's sort of, uh, the Greenway is about here. Um, and so in uh, Cross Street, let me zoom in a bit. Cross Street, which runs on the north end side of the uh, Greenway and Underground O'Neill Expressway is on this map. If I can just find it. right here. It's called Cross Street because it ran across this narrow neck between the two coves. And so these first blocks here are the uh, the old north end that you would see as you start walking up. This middle street is now is today's Hanover Street. Yeah, good question. I, I think that like because the shape of Boston has changed so much over the years, it is like very confusing and also simultaneously very interesting to see where geographic features that made a really big difference to people's lives in the 18th and 19th centuries, how they, they, um, they've kind of disappeared or, or really changed over the years. Um, I'm gonna post a feedback form, which I uh, encourage everybody to fill out. Um, if you have, uh, feedback for us, positive, negative, neutral, um, constructive. Um, I, I would love to hear it. So would Dennis, um, and we will take any of the, any of your suggestions into account for sure. Um, there's also in the feedback form an option to sign up for our newsletter. 
um, which is always a fun time to get maps in your mailbox. And if we continue doing this monthly, there will appear shortly uh, an event in the uh, Leventhal events page. And I believe mm -hmm. that that's where you get to go vote on the example. Well, what, what example we'll use, what different example we'll use next month for uh, showing history through maps. So it won't be yeah, if, down you, if you stay tuned, you get to help decide what we talk about. And if uh, you don't see your favorite thing on that list, feel free to send an email to Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dennis. Um, as always, this was very fun. And um, thank you. And people are being very sweet. So thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, it has been a blast. Hopefully, my internet was good enough. This oh, it time. Is. Yeah. I love okay. the uh, the last person who posted a comment has a big boy uh, statue <laughs> as her photo. I love that. <laughs> That's great. Great. Well, thank you so much. We're going to uh, go offline. Dennis is a uh, Radwood Haven wants to know what your position uh, is. Uh, upright on a good day. Um, <laughs> it, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, <clears throat> retired and I'm a volunteer at the Leventhal Map Center. Uh, at the library when it's open for art and architecture tour guides and for Boston by foot. Exactly. A great combination. So thank you everyone so much. We will see you next time.